07. And this is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. I could have attendance taken, please. Yes, Mrs. Durgan. Here. Mrs. Giftos. Here. Dr. Gill. Here. Ms. Casalonis. Here. Ms. Layton. Here. Mrs. Scyther. Here. Mrs. Turner. Here. Ms. Caldwell. Here. Mr. Bennett. Here. Everybody could join us in pleasure of the regions. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? I see none. Thank you. Election of board officers. Tonight we will be electing a board chair and vice chair. Are there any nominations for the board chair? I have a nomination. I'd like to nominate Leanne Casalonis to serve as chair for um, the second year. Um, I think most of us understand that um, the amount of time that we do as regular board members, um, we put in a lot of time and the chair has to put even more time in. And um, Leanne, I think you um, are happy to put that time in. You have the kind of personality and patience that allows for you to be a good chair. And um, you had to, you know, you hit the ground running last year and now you have your stride and I'd like to just see that continue. So for those reasons, I'd like to nominate Leanne to serve um, as chair. Second. Second. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you. Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Oh. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Okay, we'll take a vote. All in favor of Leanne Casalunas. As Wait, you have to you have to do comments first. Oh, I'm sorry. Discussion. <laughs> yes, thank you. Any comment? Okay. okay, let's take a vote. All in favor of Leanne Casalunas as board chair. I can't vote. Oh, you, you can vote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, is there a nomination for the position of vice chair? I um, would like to nominate uh, April Scyther for vice chair. Um, I think going along with what Hillary said, it's this job is there's a lot of hours that go into this and um, taking over the, the job of vice chair or chair is, is an ask and April has raised her hand and I think she would be, you know, we work for the wall together on the finance committee and I would like to see her She's shown interest in stepping up to the leadership position and learning more, and I think she'd be great at it, and um, I'd be excited for her to be in that role, so. Second? Second? Any discussion? I have a brief statement. I don't often read statements, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, <clears throat> this past year has been one of discovery, transformation, and growth. The five of us, uh, for the five of us, this meant coming down off a charge and energetic campaign and discovering what it meant to be a member of a main school board. As vice chair, I strive to be a balanced and objective sounding board and advocate for my fellow board members as well as the board chair. Like the majority of our team, I'd never been on a board before. However, I am no stranger to the variables and nuances that are involved in navigating communities of educators. My professional experience and formal credentials serve me well as an officer in my rookie year. Additionally, I've done my best to remain open and approachable to every side of each issue. I view the last year as a success for this board, not just for what we accomplished, but for how we discovered our dynamic as a team. In sum, I would like the next year to be one where that dynamic has an opportunity to flourish. April has demonstrated a passion, dedication, and drive that are crucial for being a leader to this board and make her a worthy successor as the next vice chair. I wish her all the best of luck as she commences her new role. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Okay. 6.0, public comment on tonight's agenda items. Okay. Seeing none, 7.0, I'd like to welcome a few folks to talk about the update for the annual community Thanksgiving dinner. Jackie, Kelly, Peter, if you don't mind coming to the podium. Um, so about four years ago, right? Four years, four years ago, um, we were at a, 
food insecurity meeting and we were talking, Kelly and I, and um, we were, and a few others, uh, about what we could do. And her idea was to do this community Thanksgiving dinner and um, it just hadn't got off the ground. I said, okay, let's do it. And she was like, when? I go, this year. And she goes, really? And it's like, yes, you know, we got to do it. Like so, October. <laughs> so, 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 yes, um, we ran with it. We did our first one. Um, we learned a lot. We still fed a lot of people and, and, and did a, um, they said a wonderful job. Um, so it's gone. Now it's kind of old hat. Like I said, the last time I was here, um, we're a well-oiled machine, and I will let them talk a little more about the rest. Yeah, he's not kidding. When we were at a meeting and it went like that. I said it in the room full of the right people and it went really fast. Um, the first year we were actually a little concerned we were going to have more volunteers than diners. But um, luckily the volunteers also ate so the food did not go to waste and we always take our leftovers to Preble Street anyway. But um, last year we fed about 225 people on the day in person and then at least 75 to-go meals were packed up um, on the spot and people took them to shut-ins or relatives that weren't able to come out or to just have some Thanksgiving leftovers, which is also part of the holiday. Um, and we had almost no leftovers for, Pre for Preble Street. So we're getting really good with our, <laughs> our numbers, um, but we've had more RSVPs this year already than we had in all the other years combined. Um, it's a free meal for anyone in the community, not just Scarborough. You don't need to RSVP, although it does help for our purchasing and cooking. Um, and we have, again, a bunch of volunteers, and many have been there for all the four years, including bringing their families that come from out of town. Um, and we have entire families that are volunteering every year. So it's amazing, and we love it, and it really is a community event. Um, we had the chief of police greeting people at the door and seating people with Jackie. Um, we have the VIPs helping out all day. Um, our families all volunteer. <laughs> the volunteer staff's getting, again, kind of big. Um, we, the Scarborough Garden Club does our centerpieces. Kids from the schools do art for each table. Um, we, it really is great. We have Project Grace helps us with the finance end and some of the organization with the website. Um, it really is a true community event and we're so thankful that we have the space to do it in. So. Jackie, you want to say something? I want to say that this really was started six years ago in Kelly Murphy's head. And she talked about it for two years before it ever got off the ground. And I and others supported her right from the start. Joanne Sizemore was a big promoter and then Peter came on board. I have the worst job in the world from my perspective. I try to raise money and I hate it. <laughs> but we have people like the One Stop uh, Party Shop, the Carter family who lives in town and their children graduated. I went, I've known them for years, so I went and I said, what can you do for us? They donate half the cost of all of the linens, all of the flatware, all of, all of the uh, dishes, the, the uh, chafing dishes, all of that. So I decided I had to raise the other half. So I twist arms on friends and Kiwanians and uh, people I know. And this year I have branched out a little bit uh, to people whom I don't know personally. You're all welcome to write a check. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, many family and friends have helped. Uh, but I want to personally thank Kelly and Joanne. Community <laughs> Services participates with us. They use a bus to go pick up people in the nursing homes. Uh, Todd and his crew uh, make certain that there are janitors there to clean up so that we can set up on uh, Wednesday afternoon and then they clean up afterwards. It's truly a town event sponsored by a few group of people, a small group of people who have included many. So thank you to you for supporting us and to Kelly for having the dream. So in closing, feel free to show up on Thanksgiving <laughs> Day, 11 to 1. Um, 
feel free to bring your families, anybody, come in, just say hi if you want, have a piece of pie, whatever, and see actually what it's all about. Um, it is really a great community, community effort, so it's a great, I mean, you guys should be really pl proud to live in this town and work here, it's great, so thank you again. At Wentworth. And it is at Wentworth, yes. In the I just get a, like, I can't take even a little bit of that credit, Jackie, because I don't cook anything. <laughs> Peter and Ann and their staff, they cook everything. I just say hi to people and get extra napkins and things on the day. So I don't, <laughs> it's not me, it's Peter and Ann and their staff. So, thank you. Well, ideas don't make the food, Jackie, so. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, thank you. Kelly, before you, yeah. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. If people in the community wanted to donate, yes. how would they go about doing so? So um, that right there is our flyer, and that's actually what it looks like on the homepage. So it's thanksgivingscarborough.org, and we have a button for donating. We have a button for volunteering and a button uh, within volunteering if you want to bake pies because all our desserts are donated by people in the community that bake the pies. Um, I think we've almost got as many as we need, but it's like a sign-up genius that so will shut, shut off when we have enough. Um, but if people want to just even come and hang out, you don't even need to eat because I know people have other obligations on the day. Um, we actually leave, all of us, and go eat another Thanksgiving meal. But um, come and spend the day with us. It really is fun, and you'll always want to come back. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right, 8.0. Again, just like from last year, this is my favorite part of our meetings, spotlight recognition. So... Um, we have a, this is our first spotlight nominee, uh, nominee or recognition, I guess, for this year. We had, um, can you move the slide? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, we were scheduled for, to do this uh, at the last meeting, but it got, it didn't get snowed out, it got weathered out. <laughs> and, um, and so anyway, so this is a continuation of that. So we're really excited. Um, we have um, Don Wyman, who is the winner of our Spotlight Award. He's a custodian at Blue Point School. Um, he was nominated, and you'll find out who, by whom in a moment. Um, but one part of what his nomination says is that um, his standards of excellence are phenomenal and bring pride to our school. Beyond his incredible work ethic, Don is kind, respectful, conscientious, and a team player. Not only has our building never been cleaner, but we have gained an in invaluable staff member who takes time to raise the spirits of others. So <clears throat> as a communications committee, and I think I can speak for the whole board, we're really ha proud to have employees like this, and we're really excited to um, put the spotlight on them and um, give them just a little bit of extra credit and, note and let people know how much uh, we appreciate that. So, um, I, so th I, this is the thing now, we do a video. So uh, the video, I think it, it's linked on there. Do you have the, oh, it's right here. Hold on. So we have a video, it will reveal who is nominated, Don. And I nominated Don Wyman for the spotlight. Award. So Don is, um, he's such a sweetheart. He is a kind and hardworking guy who is, he's really brought a sparkle to our school in so many ways. He's great with the kids, he's great with the staff, he takes so much pride in his work. Um, our building has never been cleaner, and our staff has just embraced his love of our building and how he's just taken it on as his own, and it's like he's always been here. So we love you, Don. Thank you for all that you do for us, and we hope to have you here for a very long time. Don Wyman is probably the best thing that has ever happened to this <laughs> because he cares so much about his job. We could never replace him. The kids love him. We have one little guy who will launch into his arms when he comes in in the morning for a hug and off he goes and has a great day. So when we came back this summer, mm -hmm. for the first time ever, ever, 
our classrooms were put back the way we had left them. Oh, yes. you took photos. Took photos? Yes. And in the past, I have come back to chairs stacked up to the ceiling, table on top of tables that I had to pull down myself and rearrange. And I came back in, and it was a wonderful day of, I don't have to take a whole day and remove furniture and put it back where it was. I could come in and start my planning. It was awesome. Because of Dawn's hard work here at Blue Point School, we have much healthier children who show up with a smile, glad to see him in the halls. Mr. Don does that's super helpful? Um, if he never cleaned up our school, we, there would be a lot of trash around here. Thank you, Mr. Don, for all you do. Thank you, Mr. Don, for keeping our school so clean. Thank you, Mr. Don. Thank you for keeping our school so happy, Mr. Don. actually have another spotlight winner at our next meeting which is a little bit unusual but we did uh, we skipped over the weather meeting so just again thank you to Don and I just want to point out he has his family here and there's so many Blue Point staff here to um, help congratulate him that really makes my heart feel warm <laughs> so, extra special extra special thank you thank you and you're welcome oh. to stay but if you wanted to Go and celebrate. Yeah. You are welcome to. Now's the time. Now's the time. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you. Everyone leaves. Zero superintendent's report. Nine point one, Mr. Bradley, building steering committee update. Well, good evening, everyone. This is not nearly as exciting as what just took place. <laughs> it's always um, tough following the spotlight. It's a tough, yes. Um, 
No music, no videos, just a <laughs> short report. Um, the committee's really just gotten started, so I'm here just to kind of give you an update on really who we are and what we've done to date. We just really kicked off two weeks ago. We've already met twice. Um, the committee's comprised of a few members. I'd just like to list names out, just for your information. Uh, we have Hillary Durgan, Alicia Griff Giftos, uh, Dodd Jepson, not Jetson, Jepson, uh, Sandy Prince, uh, Principal Lovejoy, uh, Principal Kelly Martin, Mullen Martin, um, Principal Steele, myself, Andrew Bradley, um, Dana Fortier, uh, Vamshi Guje, uh, Kylie Mason, and Joshua Rennie. Uh, we did have one member who has recused himself due to some family issues. Um, we're going to be selecting another member from some alternates from the original request for names. Um, I guess the only thing I really have to say is we've been reviewing the information that's already been made available to the school board over the past few years, going through that information. We're also reaching out um, to external sources, uh, looking for some community input as well as to those thoughts. Um, and our goal is to hopefully have it's our recommendations put together and to the board uh, for the December meeting. Uh, time is flying by and we wanna hurry up and get our answers to you. So unless you have any questions, do you just want to, do you have on you the next two meeting dates or three meeting dates? I do. I hope. I, I have it if you don't want it. They are November. I'm going to fail here. It's next Thursday, the 18th, 14th. 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 Yeah. And the following Monday. 18th. Which is the 18th. And then, and then the following Monday after that, which, which is, is the 25th. 25th. And they're all at 6 p.m. At the Wentworth at, School. At in the, uh, middle the middle school. school. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> at Wentworth School, 6 p.m. in the learning. I said it wrong again. Middle the school. middle school <laughs> learning commons at 6 p.m. Um, we are hoping the public will come and attend, listen in. Um, we're hoping to get a little bit of input. Um, so if you have some ideas or thoughts, please come join and let us know. And um, uh, we will be posting all of the meeting dates to the school um, website, Understanding Committees. There's a link for the Building Steering Committee. Uh, so the dates will be um, posted there along with the agendas. And um, I think we've established an email account so that individuals can email with questions or input if, if um, the public would like to um, reach out to us. Right. So I just want to quickly, um, before, if anybody has any questions, that's fine, but I just want to quickly point out, um, reiterate that uh, the six community members that we chose, or the five now, are um, all volunteering their time, and it's taking up a lot of time. We've had, um, t we have two meetings, like, within a week, and then, and then we're planning on meeting every week. Um, some of them go for over two hours. Um, <laughs> and, and then we have Andrew, who's coming and volunteering to come in and give us uh, give us updates here at the at the board level. So I just wanted to say thank you again to all the community members who are willing to take that time and um, help out the district. We're all just paying back. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so and, much. And it's amazing the skill set that we yes. have in our community and the, just the expertise. And we're so lucky that we have a very wide range of, of uh, community members who have a lot of expertise in building and uh, construction and education. So, I mean, it's really going to be a great opportunity to pull knowledge from the community and put together, a, a, hopefully, the perfect response for you. Right. I did just have one question. Are you guys taking uh, capturing meeting minutes and planning to post those? Uh, we do have meeting minutes in our running agenda. Um, we should post We those. should probably post them. Yeah, we haven't yet, but I'll talk to... I see Kelly writing, so... <laughs> 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 I'll talk to Kelly about putting those up on our, uh, in the same place that Alicia had mentioned. Great, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the update. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks for volunteering to be chair. Yeah. All right, moving on. Our enrollment update. Okay, so each month we try to provide an enrollment update, and uh, generally speaking, if you look at last year compared to this year, um, we are up few kids uh, maintaining our enrollment and this is particularly helpful as we begin to develop the budget for next year to attract the numbers. Um, you are growing as a district and that, that's the good news and 
it's just important to keep track of it so that we can make sure that we have the facilities for the kids and, uh, and we're on top of the game. So the good news is our numbers are slightly up and uh, I'll keep you posted as we proceed uh, down the road. So good evening, I'm Kathy Terrell. I'm the improvement strategist for the district and I am a member of the Every Student Graduates Committee. Um, if you have any questions during our presentation, if you could jot them down and then at the end, we'll open it up to the questions. So last year, we established a dropout prevention committee. And as you can see, we changed our name to the Every Student Graduates Committee. We wanted it to have a positive feel. Um, our members are Sarah Layton is our school board member and then Kristen Caldwell is our student school board member. Our administrators are Diane Nato, Mike Legage and Susan Ketch and then um, Denise Blaine and Will York are high school staff. We have two school guidance counselors Allison Murtha from the high school and then Michelle Grant from the middle school. And then um, Sandy Prince has joined us this year, um, interim superintendent, and Joanne Sizemore, the assistant superintendent. So the charge of the team. In the dropout prevention committee policy, it's JFC. It states that this team will review various data and evidence pertaining to dropouts, habitual truancy, and the need for alternate programs K-12, and that they will also write a plan of action and present it to the school board, which we are doing now. And then in the future, the committee will meet at least annually to review the plan and make recommendations to the board as appropriate. So last year, our team spent time reviewing research on dropout prevention, studying the profiles of our students who dropped out over the last four years, and our current interventions and alternative programs. So from the years 2015 to 2018, in those four years, the average of our dropout rate was just a half percent. So one of the research-based resources that we used was the Dropout Prevention Planning Guidebook developed by the organization um, Reinvesting in Youth. And so in the guide, they outline five dimensions of dropout prevention. The district systemic support, really creating a seamless K-12 system where expectations and structures for students are consistent collaborative networks and community supports, the use of data, teaching and learning, and then leadership development. So we as a team decided that we would um, focus on building three goals with action steps and then it would be a three-year action plan. So our three goals are to develop consistent research-based attendance and truancy practices, K-12. District and school staff will be able to make effective use of data and data analysis will lead to specific interventions and that all students will have a sense of belonging and engagement in school. So I'm gonna have Diane Neto come up and speak to the next goal. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Good evening. So I'm going to talk about goal one, which is district systemic support. And in this piece of our work, we have really focused on making sure that we have consistent research-based attendance and truancy practices in all of our schools K to 12. Um, and that's super important because we don't necessarily all sit in the same room at the same time talking about what we do in each of our schools. And so this has really helped to ensure that we have some repeatable, predictable practices happening. 
And so a couple of key things that have helped us to do that. Uh, the first is that we have updated attendance codes in PowerSchool. And what that means is um, we are coding the reasons why students are absent to help us to collect some data to define um, you know, where we should be putting our efforts. Um, and the codes or the categories are from um, state policy and are actually part of our district policy as well. And so we have sent um, some correspondence out to all of our families at the start of the year to let them know that um, not to be surprised if the secretaries are asking perhaps a little bit more information in terms of for the reason for the absence. Um, and then our group is going to be able to pull that and track that over time to assist us in making decisions. Again, we have consistent attendance protocols and procedures. So a couple of members of our committee, Brem Stoner and Chris Rohde, have uh, been working with all of our district secretaries uh, during some of their professional development time to train them and to ensure that uh, you know, they're the first faces and the first voices that many of our families see and hear, and to ensure that our practices, again, are consistent. We also have established regular attendance review committees at every school. Uh, so we have a group of individuals that on um, at least a monthly basis are taking a look at what are those trends. Um, are there students who are exhibiting uh, a lesser rate of attendance. We really look at uh, the state guidelines, which is 10% uh, or less days absent to help us identify who are those families that we want to make sure that we're reaching out to and how we can best offer support. Uh, again, related to coding in PowerSchool, we will be um, beginning to do some data analysis. Uh, that's on our action plan for winter because we have to collect enough data to help us uh, to understand where those trends are heading. And so that'll be a big piece of our work. And finally, um, that data analysis is going to lead to us exploring what would be the best strategies for us to implement and to put in place so that we can increase our regular rates of school attendance. Next is the use of data. Back to Kathy. So in order to use data, you have to have access to it. Um, so we're fortunate to have a new data analytics tool, Performance Matters. So some of our work around um, the Performance Matters analytics tool will be to train staff on how to use it. Also, now we have our MEA data, SAT, PSAT, COGAT, STAR, iReady will be going in, but we need to identify local assessments also to have in Performance Matters. We'll, we also um, are able to see attendance of students, and we're working towards being able to see behaviors also in Performance Matters. Um, we also need to identify um, early warning indicators within Performance Matters around um, course grades, attendance, behavior, and then the students will be flagged for us to take a look at, students that will need supports. Um, another action step we have is that we actually have formal data plans in place. Um, we do a lot of looking at data, but very, being very specific with what's the data used, who's involved, what's the purpose, and how frequent. We also, thanks to the Greater Sebago Educational Alliance being a member, we have a group of um, leaders who are in a leadership academy with learning sciences. And so our focus is on building leadership skills. And we have chosen response to intervention, RTI, as a focus area. Um, over the next three years to be working on. So we will be 
um, looking at building protocols and procedures across the district, K-12. We will be looking at identifying students who need supports, tracking the effectiveness of the interventions in place, and also identifying the resources. And so our ultimate goal is after analyzing all of our data and how well our interventions are working to then make sure that successful interventions are in place for all students. Next. Good evening, and welcome, Ms. Turner. Um, so in the teaching and learning portion, we have several goals, and I'll talk about the first two. One is that as a district, we have formed a very new, I think they've met on, for the very first time, a social and emotional learning district steering committee. The high school has a rather large um, membership of that, and that includes um, Mr. Terrio, our new assistant principal. He's jumped into that committee. We have two members of guidance, Jacqueline Danabel, who is a new, the new social worker, and she is working. One of her special focuses is attendance and students um, that are having trouble getting to school. So she's joined that team along with Ali Murtha, another guidance counselor in, in our school. We have two teachers that have joined, Mrs. Record, who is a health teacher, and so we thought it was a great match for her. And also Toby Walsh, one of our um, freshman science teachers. He's primarily a freshman teacher. And um, he'll add a lot to the committee. And two students, both on our student council, Jay and Maya. So we have some student rep representation on that committee. Um, the um, student council did some work last year around um, concerns about students that are anxious at school or really stressed and depressed. And so we asked them to have a representation on this committee. So we're really excited about that. Also, we're continue to, continuing to work on teaching and learning as part of our NEASC plan. And if you remember, in November of 2017, we had our visit. And in June of 2018, we got approval. We were accredited for the next decade. And um, we received 33 recommendations from them to take a look at. None of them were special recommendations. Those are always recommendations that have to be addressed immediately. Immediately. And then you have some um, focused um, recommendations and some general recommendations highlighted in general. And we've taken a look at that and turned in our two-year report promptly in October. We actually hit the send button a day early. We were very proud of that. Um, and so that has been submitted. And when you look at the overall scheme of those 33 goals, it's really quite a perfect bell curve for things that we're beginning, things that we're in progress, and things that we're finishing already. So I, it, I, to me, as I looked at that overall, I think we're in a very good spot for two years into that cycle. And now I'll turn the um, mic over to Mike. Thank you. Good evening. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, growing and adding new and relevant programs. Um, as we know, students connected to <laughs> programs outside of school leads to success in the classroom. And so we're really excited about um, offering the things that we offer, but also growing that. We get a lot of requests on a regular basis. Um, and so we're excited. Some of the new things would be like VEX Robotics, our unified basketball program, our future business leaders program. Um, we're hosting this year the One Act Play Regionals, which is a really large event um, that we decided to take on this year too and, and host. So we're excited about those, those things and making those connections for kids. We did um, a few years back start a um, a East an advisory program at the high school and really what we did was um, more focus on the A East component and <clears throat> the advisory component really became an opportunity for students to make connections to a particular student and we kind of let that um, flow for a little while in this year 
we got we took a lot of feedback from teachers and students and wanted to um, beef that up a little bit I guess and so we actually worked with um, our instructional leadership team and, and faculty and and built uh, some themes for advisory this year so we built four themes um, it's 19 total lessons that we do during advisory uh, the administrative team uh, our building leadership team actually uh, did the work of the first theme and so that was all set uh, for students uh, and teachers to to do when they when they first arrive back we're fortunate to have a administrative intern this year working in the high school and he's taken on the second um, the second theme and, and doing the providing the lessons and the training for our faculty so each faculty meeting um, before a new series of themes we do a, a workshop on how to how to uh, present those themes to the students and so that's been an exciting addition and, and gotten tremendous feedback um, themes include things like study skills so we did a workshop on study skills and the faculty presented that and provide some information to students um, good use of your time one of the one of the themes was that so they created a clock and filled in the clock on how much sleep do they get how much time do they study those sorts of things so that it was a good opportunity to to have students look at that and so I think those were good you guys think that was good yeah um, <laughs> And then, um, as Kathy mentioned, we are looking at our RTI system. And as part of the Leadership Academy, which I'm part of, we're looking at in the high school to, um, to articulate that system better. Although we think we have um, the components in place, we think that perhaps we need to articulate exactly um, the system that we're using and try to get some um, collaboration between um, the lanes that everybody works in um, to do their their work related to RTI so we're really going to be focused this year we've started uh, meeting with small groups at the high school uh, to talk about RTI and our, uh, the system that we're going to use and then try to align that to uh, the K-8 system so it'll look a little different at high school certainly but um, we're working towards that um, over the next three years. Anything else? Questions? You want to start? I'll go first. You usually go first. Um, so one one question I have is, you know, community buy-in and community support is really important anytime we try and and generate like a systemic mind shift and so I'm curious um, what kinds of questions the secretaries are asking parents when they call and if you guys have gotten any specific feedback about you know whether or not the parents are finding this <coughs> effective or invasive or right any of those things so basically it's you know, we have no interest in finding out the minute details about sure. why students aren't absent. Um, but if a, if a parent, if you were a parent and you called today and said, my student is going to be out today, um, the secretary generally will start by saying, oh, is she sick today? And that opens that conversation for the parent to say, yes, she is. Or perhaps the parent says, we have a doctor's appointment or uh, we are leaving on a vacation, et cetera. So we certainly are not interested in all of the details around why a student is not absent. We just want enough information so we can drop it into one of the categories. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you guys talked a lot about I'm a little bit confused because you talked a lot about the, the work at the high school for the social emotional learning. Has that work already been done, K-8, or? It's a new district-wide committee. Right. I, I don't know all of the members through K-8, but I do okay, know so who is are... part of it from the high school. Okay, sorry. So it is a whole district. Okay. 
I just mentioned the people that I know. Thank you. <laughs> I just was wondering if that got broken up somehow or if nope. it was a different full way. team. And I think they're okay. spending four full days throughout this year scattered um, like every couple of months they're meeting to do their work. And so when they do get together, they're working the entire day um, to make progress this year. And then from that K-12 um, SEL steering committee, they will go back, phase levels will go back and then work with other people in their phase level. And I know the K-5 has scheduled uh, a meeting to then share the information from the K-12 steering committee. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, actually, I was excited to hear about the Performance Matters program that you're using and talking about data analytics, and you actually talked a little bit about some of the leading measures that you'll use, and I'm just wondering if that's heading in the direction of actually trying to do some predictive modeling around success, because you talk about the title of this, this whole effort, I believe, was Every Student Graduates, right? So we do similar things at the community college level where we start to look for leading metrics that will help us predict a student's likelihood of completing a program or completing a degree. And I'm just wondering if there's any predictive aspect of this that comes with performance matters. My knowledge right now is that the, the early warning system helps you identify those students who might not and then your other students are on the track to success. Um, yeah. But we will be building that, and I've started to do a lot of research on what are the metrics, and they're different for different grade levels, and so we will be identifying those. It definitely takes time. It's exciting to hear that it's happening. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I can see like this globally and how all of these things are going to come together and and help out. But you mentioned specifically several times like intervention specific to ind individual children that you might identify as being at risk but is that on a case-by-case -case basis or do you have those interventions in place i mean i know you use like the yeah yes we have well we have we have tier two and well tier one is at the classroom level tier two interventions there's math support academic um study center, um, literacy support, bridge program. Yep. bridge program at the middle school, alternative ed at the high school, the VOC program. Um, trying to think of our RTI map, if there are any others. I mean, I think basically the goal is to figure out like what are the factors underneath um, a student not being connected to school mm -hmm. and then really personalizing and individualizing and figuring out like what does this unique student need and so there are some interventions that you know that we'll see across a number of students but ultimately the the goal is to really focus on like those particular students and figure out what's going to work for them because what we know is there's no one size fits all, right? Okay. And every situation is somewhat unique. Okay. Yeah, I was interested because I feel like that some of the things that might keep a child disconnected from school on one end of the spectrum, like they might need extra supports, it might be completely opposite for Correct. a child who's disconnected because they're at a level that right. is above. Mm -hmm. maybe what they're getting at school so it is it sounds like it is more individual absolutely yeah. Uh, yeah and also academic and the social emotional piece that you mentioned thank you Alicia. thank you at what point are you <clears throat> excuse me pulling the parents into the the process I think it, it just it depends on on a lot of different situations but in the RTI process, parent when a student starts to struggle, a parent is communicated with. And so during that RTI process, parents are, are contacted and, and part of the team. So they're included in the Right. There's right. Some right. tier two supports that we institute without bringing parents in as partners. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I, so to me, the, um, the truancy 
the it seems like the upfront work is is the most important and I think I heard you say that you do some professional development with those staff members. Does anybody monitor that just sort of randomly to find out how successful it is? And, and the other thing is, I'm wondering if anybody has a conversation with parents to find out what their experience is because and I know as a parent sometimes, you know, when you're calling in, you, you kind of feel guilty when somebody's asking you a question and, and, mm -hmm. and, or on the spot or, or wondering why. And so do the, do the parents understand the purpose of that in the moment, I guess, knowing that you've already communicated generally? Yeah, I mean, to date we really haven't gotten, um, you know, a lot of negative feedback or any negative feedback from parents. Um, you know, certainly that was one of the pieces uh, that Brem and Chris really talked with the secretaries about that, you know, if there were further questions that parents had, that that certainly wasn't a secretarial responsibility and, and they, that we would all expect, you know, bring those questions to us so that we can be communicating with parents. Um, but I think that folks have been okay with that. And ultimately at the end of the day, when we can communicate that it's really um, to help us to figure out how to build the best supports for our students. Um, it's, I, it's, I just wonder if, you know, if, if a parent, for example, has a, a family vacation mm -hmm. and they may have some guilt associated with taking their kid out of school, you know? And so yeah. I wonder if they're reporting accurately and how you, if the, if the secretary is saying, is your child sick and they're, you know, they're going on this family vacation, how, if they're worried about consequences or, or as a result of that, are you getting accurate information because well, they, they may be worried about that? We wouldn't know if we weren't getting accurate information, right? Because um, we would have no way of knowing that. But I think to date, based on um, the feedback that we've received, especially uh, with the other pieces, we've instituted planned absence forms at K to eight, very similar to the high school. Um, and our families have been using those. And um, again, it's none of this is about making a judgment on how people choose to um, spend their time or the reasons that students aren't here at school. It's really to help us understand um, where we should dedicate our efforts. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We actually may want to leave that because 9.4 is Mr. Transalito talking about the incredible trip to Italy. Let's see if I can. Oh. Oops. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Transalito from the uh, high school social studies department. And I'm coming again as I do annually to uh, seek your support for a trip in the summer, early summer of 2021. And this is to Italy um, exclusively. Uh, it's with EF Tours that we have been working with for a number of years. Um, they're, as I kind of do the annual pitch, but they're the nation's oldest travel company for high school students and uh, actually educational travel, really from K through adults. Uh, they're based in Cambridge, Mass, right outside of Boston, right by the Museum of Science. So they're an awesome uh, company, and we've been really fortunate because a number of my colleagues also have been working with them. As you know, Helen Van Ness and um, Brianna Kelman and Michelle Shoup have all continued to do student travel in the uh, Spanish, French, and Latin programs. So I'm kind of a, a, a rogue uh, traveler, I guess. Um, but when I started doing the tours back in 2011, I think, um, there was sort of a lull in student travel at Scarborough High School. So I kind of saw an opportunity and no one else was really doing anything and said, let's do it. And I've been doing them annually. And since then, um, student travel has really taken off. And I think um, that is true that student travel kind of begets more travel. Kids hear about it. Um, the four different programs that we kind of have going on um, in the foreign languages and then what I do um, don't really comp conflict with each other, I think, because the um, those programs are often uh, foreign language immersion. My tour is educational, and um, the kids get a lot out of it. So just briefly, I don't want to waste all your time tonight, but the tour to Italy in 2021 is just Italy. We always go uh, roughly the week after graduation and final exams. So roughly June 20th, we anticipate leaving, 
and we always try to be back by July the 3rd, just before the uh, 4th of July holidays, so kids can be there with their families. And it's gonna be a great trip. Um, we're just exclusively just in Italy, but we're gonna see um, Venice, Florence, Rome, Pisa, Ravenna. We're also going to Cinque Terre, which I've never been to before, so I'm excited to see that. And um, one final thing is, why so early are, am I coming before you? Um, but I've learned that uh, when people have more time to plan, it makes these trips more affordable, much more doable. And through the years, I will say a lot of our students who have traveled um, often are self-financing the tours or they're paying a significant amount of the cost of the tour. And I do think it really instills a um, sense of financial responsibility, a sense of um, kind of uh, commitment uh, as a young person. So I do think that it's not just kids that, you know, parents are paying the full freight. I think in most cases, Kids have um, skin in the game, they're financially contributing, and they get a lot out of it. Um, two other quick comments, though. Um, what is really cool about the travel programs we've been doing is um, this year I'm doing a World War II tour in June to London, Paris, and Berlin, which is a kind of a real history focus. So every year the tours have an educational focus, but this particular tour this June, which I've already shared with you, is really kind of unique in that we're gonna retrace um, some of the, the ships that left Britain from Portsmouth, we're gonna take a boat from Portsmouth, England, across to Normandy, where the, and visit the D-Day beaches there, and then go to Western France over to Paris, and then ultimately we'll end in Berlin and see uh, historical sites there associated with the Third Reich and, and Nazi Germany. Um, the other cool thing, real quickly, is I reached out and have a partnership with Cape Elizabeth High School, which is kind of informal. Um, I know a teacher there, and she has been doing student travel at EF as well. And my um, representative for the state of Maine who handles travel for EF uh, said to me, what do you think about linking your tour with a Cape High School tour? So there is, um, I think just nine students from Cape and I have about 24 students coming from Scarborough and we will be traveling together in June of this year. So I've never done that before. And then the last thing, um, unless you have questions, um, I've been really, really, really blessed that for most of my student travel experiences, I've been working with the very same uh, tour director uh, that I first worked with back in 2011. Uh, she's from Rome. She's been phenomenal. I've been, I think I'm the only person I've met traveling with EF ha that has been able to work with the same person over and over. Uh, I was scheduled to work with her this past June, four months ago. She got sick just before our tour and couldn't make it. But I've been lucky to have done a number of tours with her. So she'll be doing the tour again this June and presumably again in 2021. 20, uh, so I kind of feel it's great that we've got a connection. She knows Scarborough. She's been to Scarborough. She knows our school, the students, and she is um, just phenomenal. So it really adds to the, I think, the quality of the program. So. How many students do you, is there a cap on the students that you are allowed to take? Uh, not really. Um, two years ago, uh, June of, tw uh, what year are we in? 20 June of 2017, uh, excuse me, June of 2018, we had 36 students travel from Scarborough. That was the largest tour I've ever done. It was exclusively our, our students. Uh, there was no other schools involved. That was sort of the cap for me. That, that tour just kind of <laughs> took off. Like that senior class particularly really wanted to go. Uh, we were in basically Paris and um, where did we go? France and Italy. Um, that was a big tour. This year I had a much smaller group. A year later I only had 16 students traveling. So some years are, just depends I think on the, um, what the tour is, depends on who's going or uh, who, um, not sure, but some year, on average we take about 25 students. And usually we are traveling uh, with at least two other high schools from across the United States. So every year we've met kids from, you name it, we've, we've met students from everywhere. Yeah. Once approved, when will you start the discussions with the students and the families for your Italy trip? Well, we, um, we've already kind of started a little bit of the dialogue and students have started signing up and it's 20 months from departure. So the reason I begin so early is again, just for planning purposes. And inevitably, um, I rarely have students not drop out. Um, the only time I've had that happen is um, like a 
they've gotten a sports <laughs> uh, scholarship and they're now going off to the school of their choice and they have a preseason kind of thing. So I try to um, hold meetings um, very frequently. I had a meeting just about a week ago to kind of just introduce the, the idea of the tour. Uh, generally, I'll have one or two a year. Um, parents are often informed through, um, through email. They'll get an email blast from, from the high school office uh, letting them know about uh, the travel opportunity. And then as part of my um, kind of informational meeting, I'll talk about all sorts of um, opportunities that, that, that is afforded and also the financial part of it and what that is, what's involved. So I really try to uh, spread the message that these are educational opportunities that are, are um, doable. Uh, even though I know, you know everyone has to you know, live within their budget and, and be able to uh, finance things that they need to do. So I try to do it earlier rather than later. And it's interesting, sometimes you have students sign up like 20 months early and then literally occasionally um, through a month before departure, somebody will come up and say, I've decided I really wanna go, um, I've been saving my money and I wanna participate in it. So it's been, uh, it's been a great thing to do. Great, thank you. Yeah. And if anybody wants the link, let me know. I can send it over. That's right, because your, your son is traveling, I he believe, right? Traveling. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep. And um, one final thing. Um, what is really neat, though, is that I think it kind of creates a little bit of a sense of community from year to year with students who've traveled, um, not only with my trips, but I know with um, the Spanish and Latin and, and, um, and French trips, where these kids um, kind of get a real sense of confidence, I think, about being abroad, um, inevitably they um, are friends with kids who have been on prior tours, so there's kind of this little camaraderie that happens. And the other cool thing, real quickly, as I probably mentioned, is that inevitably many of them go on to do a junior abroad, a semester abroad, and some of the kids we've had from Scarborough are really, I mean, they're just phenomenal students. Um, they are the ones that are, I'm hearing from now, they're in graduate programs internationally, they're living abroad, they're working abroad, um, you know, they're doing all sorts of things all over the world. So in many ways, these trips that are kind of just a small taste of the world really set them on the path, I think, to lifelong travel and, and learning, so. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does this officially get voted on? Yeah. I don't think so. Committee reports. Um, as we welcome Kristen to the board, um, we are going to be looking at our standing committees and our liaison roles, doing a little reorganization, a little shuffling. Um, as a reminder, I'm not going to read them all off because there's quite a few, but we have a lot of activities, committees, liaison roles that the board supports and are engaged with. Um, so what I'll be doing is sending an email to everybody along with what these are a little update as far as a description and asking that you send to me what are the ones that you're interested in working with? Um, what are your passions? How much time potentially would you be able to provide to support on these? Um, and we'll be putting together a, cha a few changes here and there as those committees get relaunched. We'll be announcing them on the 21st. Um, so the sooner the better because some of them it's really kind of fitting everything together to make sure that we're moving along in supporting the district as the best to our abilities. So, okay. And then the assignments will be announced at the uh, 21st. All right, communications. That's really hard to read. Um, so as I said before, the next Spotlight Award winner will be at the next meeting on the 21st as well. Um, the fall issue of the district newsletter should be out either, I, I said by Monday, but it might be tomorrow afternoon, we'll see. Um, so look for that, it'll be emailed out to um, everybody on via Swift Reach, um, and then we'll put some paper copies out at Town Hall, um, like we normally do. Um, we did meet um, with the district communication committee. Um, So that was, it's, a, it's separate from the board communication committee, but 
Um, it had been convened uh, about, about a year ago, I think, to um, talk about how we wanted to have a social media presence um, from this by this each school. Um, and at the time, I think the instructional coaches were doing a lot of posting um, to just give an uh, insight into the day-to-day -day workings of what's going on in the schools. Um, and then, um, if you'll remember, also about a year ago, we decided to merge um, the board Facebook page and, and Instagram account with the district. Um, well, I, I forget what it was. Well, anyway, it's now Scarborough Public Schools, um, and it's all merged. And uh, we felt like there was maybe a little bit of a missing piece. There wasn't a lot of building level communication. Um, so we did have a meeting with uh, Monique, the curriculum director, and the principals from the schools. Um, and while we don't want to put pressure on the buildings to put out every little piece of information that they get, um, they can communicate that with their own parents in their own ways, but we did agree that the those schools will provide a list of quote big events, um, such as an open house or um, the week of parent teacher conferences um, that can be posted. They're going to give it to Kelly, and it can be posted on the same um, Scarborough Public Schools social media sites. Um, and then, <clears throat> lastly, our last community roundtable discussion um, in conjunction with the town council is on November 18th at 2 p.m. and it is at the Scarborough Public Library. I think that's it. Yeah, my only comment about the roundtable would be um, as liaison to the town council, uh, it has been brought up to me that maybe that program would not continue um, because we did not have uh, great community participation or attendance at those events. And so once again, we find ourselves looking for better ways, more effective ways to reach the community and, and you know go to where they are. Um, but we're kind of finding ourselves struggling um, in that arena. And so when joint communication meets again, we anticipate you know, discussing that, and so as members of the community, if there's something that we could be doing differently or, or better, you know, we would love to have that feedback. Okay. okay. Uh, while we're on communication, I do want to thank um, the district for the great communication about what was going on with Wentworth for the last few days. Um, the, it was spot on from the social media blasts that went through to the regular touches, touching bases with the parents. Um, thank you for that. That really was incredible. As was the response. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to actually really quickly say that I think, I mean, it's, it's too, everything that happened was obviously not ideal, but, um, and it's too bad that it takes that kind of event to show us this, but the way that all the schools came together to support each other and to support the students was really inspiring. And I just wanted, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to say that, but I, as we were talking about it, I just wanted to make sure I slipped that in. Um, like really everybody helped out, like everybody, the middle school, um, and, and the middle school kitchen staff who made 700 mm -hmm. extra That's meals nice. to feed those Wentworth kids. And then the high school who opened their doors and switched their schedule around to accommodate those kids. Um, it was really nice to see that kind of camaraderie and teamwork in the district. So I commend everybody um, who was involved in that and who showed like some real support to those kids and students, okay. kids and students, yes. students and staff. Okay. Finance. Um, okay, so you guys know that over the last couple of months now, we've been working with, uh, as part of the joint finance, to come up with, to sort of review the past budget cycles and look for ways that we can improve it. Um, and one of the things that we identified that we want to do was set some um, different budget goals or maybe additional budget goals that would help with communication, um, but also help with making sure that it's clear what the what is what we're trying to what the target is at what at what stage of the process right so i think last year a lot of the um some of the miscommunication and the challenges that, issues that we experienced were in there was different expectations of what was going to be delivered at first reading versus what was going to be delivered at second reading so that's the main um item that we're trying to, to tackle as a joint committee and and i'm excited to say that we we have actually come to an agreement with them um, there is going to be a formal resolution that Don and I have drafted. We weren't able to get it done by last night's town council meeting, so it'll be brought to their next town council meeting 
um, for formal adoption. And essentially all it is is us, um, we're, it's just making a recommendation for who is ever on the Joint Finance Committees moving forward that they kind of just pick up the work from where we're ending instead of starting from, from the beginning. Um, and the, the biggest change that we're going to be introducing is instead of at first reading trying to hit that 3% of mill rate, whatever that number ends up being, um, the target for first reading is going to be based off a net budget um, expense, uh, increase. So for both the town and the school. So generally the towns anywhere between two to three percent increase, schools about between five and six. So those exact numbers, TBD, um, but I think you know we're all in agreement and I think we all left the meeting, Sandy, Tom, Kate, Ruth, everyone on the, was in agreement that this was a, a way that we want to move forward. So progress there um, and the formal, like I said, the formal resolution will hopefully be adopted next week or at our next meeting and then I'll be able to share that with you guys. Thank you. Long-range planning? I have two slides today. <clears throat> so uh, for long-range planning, uh, I just want to start off by talking a little bit about Eight Corners Primary. So um, really quickly, the occupancy permits for Eight Corners and the new parts of it came through last week. Um, the budget is currently trending over budget. The reason I say trending is that some of those numbers are still yellow. We haven't actually spent the money yet. There's still things that are projected out. Um, as those yellow numbers turn to green and turn to absolute figures, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to mention this here tonight is there may be board action that's necessary, um, either in the form of line item adjustments or an appeal for more impact fees uh, or some other flavor in between. So I just wanted to get this out in front of everybody to know that this issue may be coming down the road in the next few meetings. So I just wanted to, to give that update. Um, we talked a lot in our meeting yesterday about the middle school. It's come up in several of our previous meetings, but we talked about some of our replacement strategies for the physical plant in the middle school. We've talked about the famous 123 heat pumps it takes to heat and cool that building. Most of them are past their expected service life. Um, they've replaced 12 of them. There are 19 that are slated and budgeted to be replaced this year. And if we continue on the path of the planned replacement schedule, hopefully within four to five years, all of them will be swapped out. Um, these units, uh, as I'm remembering what Todd said, have an expected uh, life of 10 to 15 years, so we're well over that um, for these units, which speaks to the dedication of our maintenance staff who have kept these things chugging along much longer than they were designed to. Uh, similarly, window replacements are underway. Um, I was told that you can tell which windows have been replaced by the ones that don't have that beautiful teal that was indicative of the 90s. Um, so if you look, you'll find those windows. I've actually never noticed it, but next time I go, I'm going to look. Um, <laughs> They've also swapped out the, um, this year, one of the big swaps for glass was the uh, skylights that were leaking. Uh, and so, you know, there's a balance between planning, planned replacement of these things, and then of course money that has to get reallocated for failures uh, in a building that's approaching an age that for a lot of modern structures, you get to 25, 30 years old, and that's when all of a sudden everything starts to turn into a pumpkin, because um, buildings just aren't built like they used to be. Um, so I'll talk a little more about planning in the next okay. slide. Um, the other thing that they're working on in their replacement strategy is upgrading some of the lighting to more efficient LEDs from the fluorescence and traditional can lights um, that were, again, were indicative of the 90s. Um, conversation that we started that ex I'm actually excited about, um, not that I'm not excited about all of this, but um, I'm excited about uh, talking about emergency egress. It's come up several times in our discussions around the middle school that there's only one road in and the same road out. Um, they've made some changes at the middle school in their procedures to kind of reroute traffic to have one way to make it as effective as possible with the physical road that's there. But they've done just about all they can do. Um, when I first took on this role a year ago in long-range planning, I heard rumors about the discussions that had happened about Green Needle Drive, and obviously the residents of Green Needle Drive do not want a permanent road blasting up and down their road with minivans full of middle schoolers every day. And if I lived on Green Needle Street, I'd probably feel the same way. Um, but one strategy that I think we should think about that the committee seemed excited about is an emergency egress. We did this at York County Community College when we built our second academic building. It, it's, a, it's an egress that's gated. It's not used as a regular throughway, which is why I put it up here in very bold cap letters. Um, but in the event of an emergency, if emergency vehicles had to get in there, if students had to be evacuated off, off campus, you could use that as a way to either a, a, a pedestrian exit for students if they had to leave and get away from the school in another way other than down the drive that's there, 
or if you know you need to make sure that emergency vehicles can get in and out in an effective way you could use this road we've had the one at york for many many years but thankfully we've never had to use it but it's nice to know it's there in the event that we did um, so it could be a way to address some of the concern around safety for access at the middle school like i said we're very early in these conversations literally one meeting into them um, but it could be an interesting thing to explore as we think about ways to make the middle school more approachable in those uh, unpredictable situations. Nick. Yes. Oh, I just had a question. So, do we own the property between the end of Green Needle Drive and the middle school? Yes. Okay. And then, do do we not also own frontage on Sawyer Road? Would that be a possibility? We do, and actually, we were talking about that in our conversations about potentially a more permanent throughway if we were to actually connect a road that we could use every day. Oh. Um, it's a lot further, so for an emergency egress, it may not be the most optimal. And even if we had that road, I think having this emergency connection that's so short mm -hmm. and so direct to a major road like 114 would be advantageous with or without that road. Um, but like I said, we're so early in these conversations. I'm, it's just exciting to think about a compromise that might help promote safety while not you know, inundating a small dead-end road with hundreds of minivans. Did anyone else notice that the middle school has a big heart in front of it? I did. Because <laughs> we love the middle school. It does have a heart. Half of that heart is the portable, so nice. <laughs> Nick, can uh, I ask you a question? Please. When you guys talk about these plans, is the police department involved? Um, I think if it gets to the point of actually doing some kind of construction, then absolutely. Okay. And these early stages, no. No. Okay. It's more conceptual at this point. Gotcha. There's a second slide. <laughs> wetlands this is Scarborough it's a big marsh um, so we were talking about our central campus and this is again another very high-tech screenshot I took from my computer um, and I had asked some questions about the land that's adjacent to the track and Todd talked about that being a very very wet area if we were to think about some kind of future expansion and I'm not necessarily talking about the primary school that's being discussed on the building steering committee I'm talking about any type of expansion that might come down the road as we think long term um, there is the possibility of remediation, which could be very expensive. Um, and Sarah, who's on the committee with me, actually has sent an email off to, uh, to town leadership to get more clarification about what work has been done. Um, first response is that when they did the public safety building, they did some work back to the drive that, cut, that you see cutting through the middle there, but not past that. Um, so the re wetland remediation that was done on the rest of the municipal campus may be as old as 2012. And usually those are only good for five years. And in a town like Scarborough, I bet five years is pushing it um, because of wetlands and, that, and marshes and how things move with all the construction that's happened around that area. Um, but it, we did want to bring up the conversation. And, and actually, Todd is looking into what it would take to kind of get a final kind of idea of what we could do in our municipal campus. We keep talking about it, um, but we really want to try and understand what potential, if any, is there as we look at, at new schools in our future. I think that we had um, a, some discussion about this mm -hmm. at the building st steering committee, and, and it's not my expertise, obviously, but um, but it is the six community members' expertise. Yes, yes. So they knew a lot and, and about so it. They, I mean, the, it's really interesting to watch their minds work when that's what they do. But you know, they were saying that it depends on the the proposed use, and that something like fields might be much easier to remediate than than buildings, and so. Todd was involved in that conversation, but it, just so you know that that would, you know, hearing them talk about that seemed like there was a variety of, of uses and some of them might not be as um, problematic to, to change as others. Yeah, and it was exciting to hear that, that I mean, I'd always been led to, led to believe that that land was just big red X to it. There's nothing we can do, but the, the fact that there are possibilities actually makes it feel a little brighter, which is good. Um, so there'll be more information to come, probably through the building steering committee, um, but certainly as we look long range, um, we'll be getting more information about how we can use our, our campus. Um, the last part of this kind of ties it all together, and so I, I pitched this idea out to the committee at our last meeting that um, we do a lot of planning in matrix form, uh, in the form of budgets that Kate Bolton works very hard on, and stuff that Todd talks about when he plans out you know, how he's going to replace out lights and heat pumps. Um, but what I would really love for our committee to work on, and I'd love to float this idea to see what you guys think, is to actually have um, a written kind of digestible plan that's a more strategic layout. You know, you'll have a mission, a vision, some priorities, like around 
you know, uh, capital improvements or long range improvements, looking at safety and energy use and promoting longevity of our structures. Like it says in that last bullet, a lot of this information exists, but I think if we were to able to construct it in a plan that is more easily understandable to the general public, it could help our community understand just how hard our district works to keep our buildings up and going, particularly the aging ones. Um, as we talk about new schools, I think that's really important um, because there are a lot, there's a lot of money that's, that's, that's budgeted and that's spent and it's necessary just to keep our buildings running. And, and certainly, I, I think a lot of our community may not be aware of that. And so I think a plan like this that actually shows how we look a few years into the future could help them get their head around that. So that's something that we talked about and there seemed to be a lot of positive energy about at, around at our last uh, meeting. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, so that's something that we're looking to do. It would be really cool too if it could like cross-reference the other things that uh, like relate to it. So mm -hmm. like cross-reference the budget, cross-reference Todd's, you know, 123 heat pumps. And exactly. That's great. Yeah. Just a question for uh, Alicia and Hillary. Have you guys seen the, are, are you, have you provided as a resource to the, the steering committee, the municipal campus master plan that showed I think it's done in 2012. It showed um, like the possible locations within our municipal campus for new properties. Uh, no, I have seen that, but no, we should put that in the folder. I will share with you guys. Yeah, and can. then you can you can pass it's, that on. To so me. I think this is this is part of what Harriman used when they made their report <laughs> to us um, because it shows right. So it shows like there's some usable well technically usable area behind the middle school, but it's also very wet. There's that area across from the current fields. Uh, the area um, behind the middle school does have vernal pools, which is another big concern yeah. there. Yeah. Those are labeled on the map. Yeah, too, yeah. those cost a lot of money yeah. to mm -hmm. build yeah. on, <laughs> okay. basically. Um, and there is some, I, I shouldn't, but there is some talk too about like, I think towns have a certain amount of wetlands that they can mitigate. Mm -hmm. And I think we maybe are over our cap you are. by a lot. You are. So it costs more. Because it costs more for when we did wet when we did wet work. Right. We had to pay a lot of money to. Um, yeah. Do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But luckily, like I said, the community members on this committee are, um, like, insanely knowledgeable about this kind of stuff, which is great. Negotiations. This is my first swing at this one, so you'll have to bear with me. I like your so, graphic. Um, what was that? <laughs> I like your graphic. Thank you. That would be nice. Uh, so negotiation remains a, um, a closed process, which um, former, former board member Amy Glenn shared with you several times. Uh, so it limits what we can say publicly, obviously, but I do have a few updates that I've been given permission to say. So first, I'll just say that Amy will be continuing with us to lead the process with the SAA and our teachers. That was a board action we took a while back. Um, and as someone that's on that committee, I'm very grateful for her diligence and her continued service. Um, the negotiations team remains committed to pursuing a new contract for our teachers that is both progressive and responsible. Um, and so what I'll add to that is what I was told I could add to that. So this is, I'm gonna read this too. Um, both sides attended two mediation sessions but were unable to reach consensus. That was a determination by the mediator herself. Therefore, the next step is to go on to fact-finding. Fact-finding is a process that involves a three-person panel that will make recommendations, specific recommendations, as to how to resolve the remaining issues that are being negotiated. There's a formal report that's produced through fact-finding, and at the time of that report's delivery, both sides can mutually agree to accept those recommendations as the um, resolution of the contract if they, we, or they do not, then that report has the opportunity to become public. And so that's kind of the next big step. And then we would go back to the table. So one thing I think that's a misnomer about fact-finding, and I'll say certainly it was for me, is that fact-finding is not a binding process. It is just a more formal, more kind of documented version of mediation. So um, that's where we are, that's where we're heading. Um, and once we have the report back, we'll know exactly where we stand and, and what our next steps are. Thank you. liaison information. Start with you, Sarah. Yeah, okay. I'll do my best and you can chime in. <laughs> Will do. Uh, Leanne and I have been uh, 
is it hopscotch in each other? Yeah, Frog leaving each works. other? Never <laughs> <really Frog>. <laughs> um, so the, the the summary of the charge of this committee is essentially to prevent to present in December town council options for a community center if we do it on our own. What, what the cost, what the design would look like, what the cost of it of that would be, or if we did it with Edge, so taking advantage of this opportunity we have right now in town. Um, so the process that they've been going through is essentially to be able to come with a design that they can give to the uh, developers, so the Rosbera Brothers, and they can basically give us a price tag for what that would look like. Um, so hopefully you guys would have all seen the survey that went out. Um, they were expecting about one, they were hoping for about 1,000 respondents. They got 2,000, which was, is pretty good. Um, so everyone was happy with that, and they've used the results of that survey to build out what the programming needs would be from the town based on what people have said that they wanted. Um, so no surprise, pool was a hot button. Um, I think childcare um, location, a, tr a walking track, and a couple other things. And so that basically started the, the spec of the building, um, but it's since grown. So as of this week, the the potential design for the building has has grown by about uh, three times, three or four times what they had originally discussed. Um, and so I think, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see what happens from here. Um, ultimately, when that price tag comes back, that'll be, I think, a good indicator of what we can keep and what we need to remove. Um, I wasn't at the last meeting, so the ain't chime in, but it seems like people are just kind of throwing in everything, and then mm -hmm. maybe we'll cut later. Yeah, um, it's we have built everything that you could possibly want um, and I think at that point we'll start coming back and making some modifications um, it, they're great ideas it's got some legs we'll just see where things can land as far as the cost um, the sizing um, right now this would be one heck of a footprint um, to bring forward the meetings are open. They're every Monday night at 6.30 at Wentworth's Learning Commons. Um, please come. It's actually quite fascinating to hear this coming together. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So when the EDGE presented to us and previously to town council, they had indicated that they were coming to Scarborough, whether there was a town partnership or not. This um, increased footprint, did they say if that's contingent upon the town's partnership or um, the increased size would be the town's portion gotcha okay. thank you mm -hmm. town council uh, last night the town council certified the uh, election results and we are very pleased to welcome Alicia and back to her seat and well a new seat mm -hmm. and yeah. Kristen to <laughs> and it's hard not to well. offend <laughs> <laughs> Um, also, winners were Betsy Gleistein and Ken Johnson for town council seats. Uh, they, the results of the um, three bond issue questions, uh, the question pertaining to the track, um, ultimately failed, um, which although it is uh, technically a town project, obviously it has a huge impact for our students and our schools. And so um, I look forward to, you know, picking that conversation back up as a board and figuring out how, um, what we can do to, to progress that conversation in the future. Um, and then the other two bond issues, the pumper truck um, passed, and, as well as the land trust bond. So that also passed. That's it. Okay. I have a question. So um, has town council given any indication of, I mean, it seems like there's, a lot of really expensive plates in the air right now um, that, well, I don't know. Maybe, it seems to me that not all of them can be afforded. Has town council given any indication as to like prioritizing that or how they're going to um, move forward with any of those three things? It's a great question. Um, as liaison to the school board, uh, Councillor Johnson has reached out to me. Um, he also reached out to Leanne. Um, to discuss the possibility of finding a way to bring these projects to one table um, 
to at least bring key players into the room together so that we can have a better understanding of exactly what each group is working on, whether there's overlap, whether there's services that we can offer each other, and, and really get a better understanding of what each other's asks are, um, and whether or not um, any kind of prioritization would come out of that committee, I can't say. Um, I don't know if it, would be, if it would be a workshop or what that exactly would look like. Um, but there is definitely, I think, town council appetite um, to, to maybe find a way to make this, oops, sorry, to find a way to make this process more collaborative and cohesive rather than everybody operating in isolation. Uh, this is not on the slide um, because it's not a typical liaison role, but I did want to report out quickly on the um, delegate results um, from the MSBA um, proposed resolutions. I was, if you guys remember, you voted me delegate and I had the pleasure of representing Scarborough in a room of 96 um, other delegates. Uh, it was a learning experience for sure. I thoroughly enjoyed it and um, all of the parliamentary procedure, um, I really got into that part of it. Um, there were there are people in the room who are official parliamentarians, which I didn't know was a role that you could have, so watch out for that when I pick that up. Um, but I wanted to share out the results of the resolutions to you. Um, uh, I also wanted to discuss something um, for the future and, and to kind of have this on our, on our plates for the next time we do this. Um, one of the things I found really challenging about this um, role was that we had kind of discussed these things, you know, at our board level, and we had voted and agreed on how we were going to um, move forward with each resolution. Um, there's a lot of amending and proposing and changing of words and, and, and quite frankly, trying to change the entire um, proposal at, some, at different points. And this didn't happen in the end. Most of the amendments were voted down. Um, and so I did feel comfortable bringing forward our recommendation on the proposals that were, were being brought forward. But there were several times during this entire process where I felt like um, the resolution was being so heavily amended that I would not have felt comfortable voting. Um, and I don't know whether that's something that we can kind of navigate as a board or whether this is something that we should bring up you know, at a, at a bigger state level um, so that they're aware of some of the challenges that, you know, some of the delegates have. And that may have just been my interpretation of being the delegate, too. Um, it was also Hillary's. So, so you know, I just... actually abstained from one because it changed so dramatically right. from what I had authorization from the board to agree to that I, I didn't feel comfortable voting yes or no. Right. Um, there was also another um, component to being a delegate that I was unaware of until we were there, which was the election of the formal MSBA members. Um, and so I actually abstained from those votes uh, because that was not something that we had discussed. All of the seats, that being said, all of the seats except one were uncontested. Um, and so those people, you know, would have taken their seat whether I abstained or not. Um, but there was one seat that was, you know, there were two people running for um, district representation, and that was not something that we had discussed, and so I abstained from voting. Um, so to wrap this up, the resolutions, and I'll just read the titles um, and then let you know whether they passed or not. So resolution one was staff use of social media. Um, that passed. Resolution two was school board use of social media. That passed. Resolution three was legislative focus on students. That passed. Resolution four was board teacher relations. That passed. And resolution five was CTE funding restoration. Uh, this, of all of the resolutions, was the resolution that was amended the most heavily. Um, I still felt like in the end the wording did represent what we had discussed as a board and so I did vote in favor of that and it, all, it passed as well. Thank you very much. Student report. I don't have the quick card over there. Okay.
All right, so I wanted to start out my report by congratulating some of Scarborough High School's athletic teams. So girls volleyball competed in the Class A state championship last Friday. They came up a little bit short of Falmouth, but they still had an amazing season. And then girls soccer beat Chevrus in their regional final on Tuesday. So they are headed to Hamden Academy for states this Saturday. Um, and they're playing Camden Hills for their third time in a row in the state championship. It's at 5.30 at Hampton Academy, and I wish them the best of luck. So last Friday, the Thirst Project came to the high school and they gave a presentation during advisory about their work as an organization. So they're, they're an organization that aims at bringing clean drinking water to 600 million people around the world who go every day without it. And they partnered with Key Club on different aspects of their work and they are working to fundraise for the organization. And then also Key Club held their annual leaf raking day where they raked about 10 houses. These homes are usually elderly people who aren't able to rake their own leaves so the community really appreciates the work that Key Club does. And then also I want to include an activity, activity that they did from their most recent activity meeting where they made bracelets up in the top right corner. The middle school held a week of unity to support bullying prevention and I've included some pictures from October 23rd where they wore orange because orange is the color for national bullying prevention. They were able to participate in an assembly and had fun um, different days, different spirit days that whole week. And the Career Pathways and Learning Commons at the high school hosted Lanco Integrated. Um, and they presented to high school students about opportunities in STEM engineering and robotics. So I'll hand it over to Max. Alrighty. Um, so last Friday, the Chicago-based Constellation Men's Ensemble, they came and they performed for the um, middle and high school students in an assembly. And um, they actually workshopped with the chorus at the high school as well. And I'm in chorus, so I was had a firsthand experience of it. And it was really eye-opening for all of the students. I think we all learned a lot about what it would be like to work in um, like a performance for a career. And it was really great. They're extremely talented. And then uh, last Friday, we also had our first, um, our homecoming concert where Constellation also performed at that. Alrighty. Um, so Oak Hill Players, they have um, Peter Pan is opening next Friday the 15th. Everyone should come see it. I'm in it. It's going to be great. <laughs> um, so in the picture in the middle, in the background, you can actually see them flying with the um, uh, equipment that we purchased. We started flying a couple of weeks ago. Uh, all of the students really enjoy it. I think it like adds a lot to our show. Everyone's taking it really seriously. It's been a really great learning experience for everyone. And then the bottom two photos are of the number True Blood Brothers, I think it is. I took a lot of photos, so it's like it all blurs together. And um, overall, the show's been going really well. We have our first full dress rehearsal tomorrow, and then we open a week from tomorrow, and then we run for two weekends, so. If you can come, you should really come. I mean, I'm in it, so you kind of have to come see it. I'll cry if you don't, so there you go. Uh, Oco Players also, uh, this past Sunday, they hosted a spaghetti supper. Um, at this spaghetti supper, we had um, a silent auction, a raffle, a 50-50 raffle, and a couple of other things to raise money. We also uh, served an Italian dinner, and we, uh, premiered six numbers from the show for the audience and overall we raised um, like $2,500 which is great so it was a really successful event we hope to do it again in the future so yeah um, next uh, a couple weeks ago there was a fall festival in the middle school gym and uh, I went with Maria my sister she's in second grade she goes to Pleasant Hill and there were lots she's of fun activities. She's, oh. she's the cutie in the purple raincoat. <laughs> she's something. Um, 
she, uh, there was a raffle, there was a lot of fun activities where you could get prizes. As you can see, there was a whole table of just cupcakes, so she got a lot of sugar. And um, she went, saw her friends, she had fun, a lot of people there, like a lot of children under the age of five were there, like a lot of them. So she had fun. I took Advil when I got home, and um, yeah, it was great for the students. The students. Um, uh, let's see, at Eight Corners, students carved pumpkins for Halloween, and also at Pleasant Hill, each class classroom, they had to carve a pumpkin relating to a book, so that's really fun. And then um, on the left, there are students at all the primary schools participating in Fire Safety Week where the fire department came down to teach students about how to be cautious in case of emergency. And they also got to tour the fire truck, which is like the most fun part. And then on the right, students were sharing a special September, October birthday lunch with Acorners principal, Miss Lovejoy. That's, that's my daughter. That's it. Yeah. You captured my daughter. Did you know that? Oh, I didn't take these pictures. Oh, you did. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, one thing, uh, I did see Mrs. Crosby, the Wentworth principal, yesterday, and she told me to just like say everything's going well at Wentworth. Um, didn't have school today. Don't have school I don't, tomorrow. They don't have school tomorrow, so like great for them. Um, they came to the high school Friday and they went in the auditorium, like the exact time that we were going to have our rehearsal in the auditorium. So that was fun. We got to wear our costumes in the hallway, so that was cool. See all the janitors looking at us and judging us, but it's fine. <laughs> um, that was really fun. They were all really well behaved, composed, you know. They watched the Lorax, so we got to sit backstage and watch it too. That was always a bonus. And then, yeah, I think it ended up going really well, so that's everything. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, as we're making plugs for student activities, just because it's football, um, playoffs start tomorrow. We're going to hope that there's not enough snow in Bangor to call off the day. Um, so tomorrow night, if folks are around and want to freeze, football starts. All right, new business, 12.1. I'd like to put together 12.1, 12.2, the meeting minutes of our workshop and our business meeting from October 3rd. Is there a motion to accept the meeting minutes as written? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Great. Um, Diane and Mike, if you guys would mind coming up to the podium, we'd like to talk about 12.3, the Special Olympics donations. Great. So we are pretty excited to come to you this evening to let you know that both the middle school and the high school have successfully um, been awarded uh, grants to help us with our unified programs at each level. I know the middle school award was 2,500. As was the high school. And the high schools was as well. Um, so we're pretty excited to get that kicked off. Um, at the middle school, um, we have a unified club. Um, that um, is on Wednesdays after school for anyone who's interested in signing up. Um, and then we'll have a, there's a small basketball component at the middle school level, so we'll have um, a basketball component in winter two season after our regular school basketball season ends. And um, we'll compete against other middle schools uh, in our area, I think we have a total of four games scheduled for this year, but we're pretty excited. Um, I think the Unified Club is actually one of our biggest clubs right now. We have over 30 students who are coming on Wednesdays, and right now they're planning um, uh, several activities <coughs> for Inclusion Week, which is in December coming up. And so we'll have a spirit week um, right around inclusion. So we're pretty excited about kicking this off for our second year. Fantastic. Do you, do you have any ideas how you're going to use the donation? Oh, yes. So the donation is going to go directly to um, fund the stipend for um, the club advisors and the coach. And then the uh, remaining funds, if there are any, will help us with uh, fees for um, officials or um, shirts for the club members. Was, you, I know you had the club last year. 
We did. Was the, the coaching position already funded? No. So, so last year, um, again, um, you can get a grant from the Special Olympics of Maine for two years to help you kick off and start a program. And so um, this will be the last year that the middle school is able to um, take advantage of that. So next year, uh, you'll see that as an addition into the middle school request. The uh, high school program is slightly different. It's an MPA sanctioned sport. So it runs like a regular sports program. And um, we did hire a coach. We're still in the process of hiring an assistant coach. They'll have eight games. They'll participate. It's only basketball. They'll participate uh, three days a week. That'll either be a practice or a game. They start in January and go till March. Um, and there's a tournament at the end. Um, there's no real goal ball, but there's a tournament at the end. They used to give a goal ball. They've stopped doing that. But it runs just like a regular sanctioned MPA sport. And all those rules apply. So I, can you remind me when we um, put the high school unified basketball into the budget last year that included the 2500 well, um, the, the funding came from a few sources, um, and the 2500 was not part of that. And so um, we, we changed some money. Um, so for example, I had some professional development money from my department that was removed from professional development and earmarked towards funding unified basketball instead. Um, and we're getting using some volunteers um, and paying for it some different ways. So can this money be used to expand the program? No, the it's not. We don't. It's not even going to cover the cost of the program. Okay. So we're going to use the twenty five hundred dollars to offset expenses in the program. So like transportation alone, we have eight games plus a tournament. So they're going to be transported to four of those sites plus other other places. So um, the twenty five hundred dollars is very helpful. It's um, we'll have to see where we end up in the total cost of the program. Have you had um, an informational session yet to gauge interest? We've been I've been meeting with special education director and and the special education teachers. So we have a packet together and they're going to, um, because there's criteria for student involvement, they're going to, it's gonna be on an invite um, basis. And so they're gonna be handling that through special services. And then on our end of it, we'll be handling um, getting kids involved through uh, as partners. So there's partners and student athletes. Is that a um, Probably because um, we can only have 15 kids on the team um, total. Um, and some of the rules are such that there are two partners with three athletes on the court. Like in, in basketball, for example, it's different every sport, but in basketball there's five players on the court at a time. so three are athletes and three and two are partners. Um, and so the coach is actually going to look to recruit some, st some student partners. I did meet with the buddy system uh, students today because I think the buddy system is a natural fit for this program and this relationship. So we'll be, um, you know, building building that into hopefully the buddy system program. So, and some of those expenses will be reflected in my budget proposal this year. Thank you. All right, motion to approve the uh, two checks for $2,500 each. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, great. Thank you very much. 12.4, um, 
If there's no objections, I'd like to put 12.4.1, the high school co-curricular positions, and 12.4.2, high school co-curricular volunteers together in one motion to approve as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. 12.4.3, the middle school co-curricular positions. Move to accept as presented. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion on that? Can, oh, just for the um, sake of the public, the agenda doesn't give a description. Maybe we, we could just describe that. Um, these are the co-curriculars such as Chorus, the Computer Club, um, their news. These are all of the clubs that happen at the middle school. Um, they're funded out of our general fund. Well, these are just the advisor positions. Though, yes. Not the clubs. Correct. Well, the advisors for the clubs, sorry. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Unanimous. 12.4.4, um, Wentworth co-curricular positions. Um, this is similar to the middle school, so it would be photography, technology, um, the world language, yearbook, et cetera. Um, move to accept as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Passes unanimously as well. And finally, 12.4.5, the middle school basketball coaches. Move to accept as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Just name them, please. Um, I don't have them in front of me. I'm sorry, I didn't print that page. If somebody does have it and wants to read it, that'd be great. I don't have either. 12.4.5. Yeah. I stopped it, unfortunately. My printer must not have come through all the way. Um, I stopped at point four. I don't. I don't think we I don't think we got that. Yeah, I don't think we did either. Okay. So can we table this? Yes, one? we can absolutely table this until yeah. the twenty first. Wait, she's got one. Yeah, Thank you very much. Okay. Seventh grade boys would be Scott Weymouth. Seventh grade girls is Charles Norton. Eighth grade boys is Ryan Colpitz, and eighth grade girls is Brian Rice. And what, how are those funded? General fund. Motion to accept as read. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Great. Um, 13.0. Motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 40560 for the purpose of discussing the superintendent's contract not to return to public session. So moved. Second. And all those in favor. Great. Thank you all.